Rana, thanks for joining me today. Um, so Affectiva software is used by over a thousand brands, quarter of the Fortune 500. Tell me about some of the most common use cases you've seen. Yeah, so we're in the business of capturing people's nonverbal communications, your facial expressions, your vocal intonations, your activities, your behaviors. And there are so many applications of the technology. The very first product we built was to help Fortune 500 companies and any company really capture the emotional engagement their users have with their content to understand the moment by moment responses people have to video content, for example, and then be able to make really key decisions around media spend, um, optimizing the video content to maximize engagement. So that's kind of one use case. We're also um, uh, kind of exploring the applications of it in automotive to increase uh, driver safety and also personalize the mobility experience. So we're able to detect things like, you know, if the driver's falling asleep or if they're um, tired or distracted, you know, texting while driving. And, and then the car is able to intervene in, in real time to ensure and maximize safety. And are there any projects uh, that you're working on or that you have in the works that kind of exemplify where you see the technology going in the future? Um, there's a number of use cases that I feel like just have a potential to really transform and, and help people. Um, Early on, when I was at MIT, before starting Affectiva, we explored the application of the technology to help autistic kids. Um, so at the time, this was you know over 15 years ago now, we had we built these glasses uh, with cameras in it, and it gave the kids um, who are mostly autistic real time feedback around the experiences and the engagement they had with other people to help them maximize like looking at people's faces, understanding these nonverbal signals. We're now partnered with a company called Brain Power that is bringing this to market uh, through a partnership with Affectiva and Google Glass. So I'm excited about that. With the pandemic, I feel there's a lot of opportunity around mental health, honestly, like there are so many facial and vocal biomarkers of anxiety, stress, depression, um, and other mental health diseases. And I, I think we have an opportunity to leverage the amount of time we're spending, you know, for better or worse in front of our devices and use that as a way to understand a person's baseline and then flag to the person or a family member or even a doctor if we see kind of red flags um, or signals indicative of, um, you know, mental health concerns. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. And I think, you know, that's a really good example, just mental health of like a really obvious beneficial use case for this technology. At the same time, I, I know it's, you know, easy to imagine it being used for ethically questionable purposes as well. So, and I also know that you don't say yes to every project. So what is the kind of ethical framework that you use and how do you decide what projects to take or what to leave? When we spun out of MIT, uh, my co-founder, who's a professor at MIT, Rosalind Picard, and myself, we sat around her kitchen table and basically said, oh my God, there are so many applications of this technology. Where will we draw the line? And, and we articulated a set of core values that for us have really driven our business strategy. So things like respecting people's privacy, recognizing that this is so personal data that can be used to manipulate people's decision making. And, and we're we know that and we understand that. And so as a result, this meant that some industries we just turn away or we, we just don't play in, right? Like, so for example, security and surveillance, lie detection. And we routinely get approached by not just the US government, but other governments around the world who want to license the technology for these industries. We, at some point, we turned, you know, millions and millions of dollars of venture funding from the venture arm of an intelligence agency because it, we felt that it was not in line with why we started the company and our, and our core values. So, and, and at some point in time, my scope was just kind of making these decisions for Affectiva. I'm now very vocal and I try to convince and, and bring along other AI companies in the space as well. And, and, and really, I don't know, edu educate, educate the world around where this can go wrong and, and hopefully try to avoid that. And I imagine there's probably a lot of kind of learning as you go as well. So have you ever adjusted that framework based on experiences or projects that you've taken on? Yeah, so there are definitely, especially with public safety, like people's sense of public safety changing over time. Um, I found that we as a company have these internal debates on whether it's time to revisit our stance. So for example, 
often after, you know, acts of violence or public shootings, we get around, you know, as a company and say, okay, is it now time to ex explore the applications of our technology and, for example, detecting anomalous behavior in airports or public spaces? And, and we have a heated debate. Some people feel like we can be really helpful. Our technology can be really helpful. But I still think because of how nascent the technology is, there's so much potential for discrimination against certain populations, profiling, m abuse and misuse of the data. So we've we always come out or so far we've been coming out um, kind of on, on the side of, yeah, we, we don't think we ought to be taking on this uh, this business. But that's an example where we've been debating it or we kind of routinely debated as a team. Yeah. Can you, you know, kind of walk me through an example of a type of project that you decided not to take on after this kind of debate? Yeah, one um, one one is is very actually timely give, given um, where where we are in you know historically like we're going through a presidential election in the United States. Um, so a few years ago, um, you know, we test we test people's responses to content, and we did a pilot test where we were able to just by looking at people's smile and smirk. This is a smirk smirk responses to um, presidential debates, we were able to predict with over 90% accuracy who you were going to vote for. Because because is the content of what's being said resonating with you or are you skeptical and like no, just not bought in? So that we know that there is a lot of applicability in political advertising and, 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 and um, yeah, in the, in the realm of politics. But we very quickly decided that it was going to be very hard to um, to stay detached from from the political messages and, and be impartial. And so that's an entire space where even though it's really kind of very similar to what we do in, in the world of brand testing and content testing for, you know, consumer packaged goods and, and other, you know, Fortune 500 companies, we felt that the political application of it is something we did not want to participate in. Have you thought about putting in any sort of uh, safeguards into the technology to sort of make sure that things are being used, um, you know, in a way that you want? Yes, the biggest concern I have around these technologies is unintentionally building bias into the algorithms. And the, the way this happens is if you're not intentional and thoughtful about the data, the diversity of the data and how you sample examples to make sure that it's representative of the population. So this is an area where we spend a lot of our mind share. In fact, last year, I, I, I was adamant that to prioritize this on our product roadmap, I tied the implementation of these safeguards to our executive bonus plan. You know, usually it's driven by, you know, you hit these revenue numbers and I was like, okay, we need to hit these revenue numbers, but we need to also implement these um, bias mitigation approaches. Um, so I, I, this is something we really are very passionate about. The best way to mitigate bias, honestly, is to ensure that your team is diverse. Because if you have different perspectives around the table, we each have our own blind spots. And the more diverse the voices, the more, you know, the more representative it's going to be for of, of who the end users are. Yeah. When you talk about bias in the product, can you give an example of like how that kind of bias might play out? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's over the last couple of years, there's been a lot. There's been a huge backlash, actually, against face recognition technologies that have been primarily trained on a very kind of um, non-diverse data set of, of middle-aged white guys. And so when, when you then deploy these systems worldwide, it wouldn't recognize a woman who looks like me, for instance. And that's because there's not enough representation of people who look like me in the data, in the training data set and in the test data set. So um, we, we are not in the business of face recognition. We don't do identity recognition, but because we are in the business of identifying your facial expressions and your emotional expressions, we still have to ensure that the data is diverse. We have examples of people who are obviously gender diversity, ethnic diversity, age diversity, but even things like, yeah, with wearing glasses or not wearing glasses, wearing the hijab or not wearing the hijab. So we have to really think carefully about diversity of the data across many, many different angles and parameters. And it's, 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 it's not easy. It takes a lot of um, commitment to make sure that, you know, the data is diverse. 
Yeah. And as you sort of just mentioned before, you know, mitigating bias does have a lot to do with who's behind the technology and hiring. So how do you think about that in your hiring process? Um, again, intentionality is super critical. Um, as we, you know, e even though we're a female founded um, AI company, it's still very hard to, um, to ensure that our, you know, our hires are diverse, again, across multiple angles, not just gender or ethnicity, but even diversity of backgrounds. We don't all have to be machine learning scientists or computer scientists, which is my background. I think the you know we have art historians or people who have very different backgrounds because they bring a unique perspective to the table. I think the way you know one one example is over the we have a very robust training and internship program over the summer. Um, but if we weren't intentional around diversity, we would end up with hires from these top schools who have computer science programs who are able to travel to Boston for the internship. Um, and, and this summer, because of COVID, we had to pivot to a virtual summer program and we use it as an opportunity to really um, tap into a diverse, you know, for me, access to these opportunities is really important. So we, we said, okay, if, if you've never had any coding experience, but you're driven and ambitious, we're going to take you on. And these kids did amazing. Some of them are high school students from very underprivileged communities who would never, you know, they would never... Um, even think that Affectivo would be applicable, but I'm, I'm proud that we were able to commit to that as a company. But it took work again, right? You have to be intentional, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's clearly like you're, it's something you're taking very seriously within Affectiva, but sort of industry-wide, um, do you think it's something that leaders are really um, paying close enough attention to right now? Um, well, on the one hand, I'd say not enough, but on the other hand, I do feel like things are changing. I'm part of an organization called All Rays, and we are on a mission to support female founders and female investors because we need, you know, we need more diversity across the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem. Um, and we, we just do a lot of events supporting, um, yeah, female founders and female funders, but also minority groups within that population as well. So black women founders and, you know, Latina investors. And, and, and I, 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 I feel like I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we're making progress. Um, although also, you know, on the other hand, we do know that COVID has disproportionately impacted um, female, female founders who are, for instance, raising venture funding, um, which was already abysmal, but it's even harder with the pandemic. So I, I feel like we have a lot of work to do, but um, uh, you know, we are making progress. And so when you think about the next generation of AI leadership, um, what do you see as some of the most important characteristics? Ooh, um, first, and I'm so excited about this younger generation of, of AI leaders. First, a commitment to social justice. I see that uh, in all the young people we work with. Um, supporting inclu being inclusive, not just diverse, but also being open to these different voices. Um, and, and the third is interdisciplinary. I really think uh, we need people from different backgrounds. The humanities are going to play a really big role in how we design technology. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really committed and excited to support these next generation leaders. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Rana, and um, back to Web Summit. Thank you, Ariel.